Just a few words of announcements before we do get into the rest of our service. First of all, birthdays and anniversaries. And so basically I think what we have left is Mark and Donna Gary have an anniversary coming up. No, not yet. Not yet. So, no, I haven't found you sleeping on one of the pews here at night. So obviously you didn't miss it. Jessica Long and Richard Green have birthdays coming up on the 30th, so happy birthday. All right, we'll be 
right along. We want to let you know what we're going to do tonight in our evening fellowship hour. Uh, again, we get together around 5.30. We have some uh, food together, share some fellowship, and then at 6 o'clock, we have a video. Tonight, this video is very, very interesting. It's Israeli discovery devastates scholars. Now, this is produced by Monk for Israel. The gentleman in the picture is an Israeli-born Messianic Jew who works as a tour guide in Israel. Anyway, he talks about something that Patty knows all about, <laughs> Mount Ebal. You know about Mount Ebal, right? Uh, in Israel, Mount Ebal Agarism. We showed you a video uh, a couple months ago about a little lead tablet that had cursings on it. Well, that's where the story begins, but that's not where the story ends. This story goes far beyond this little lead tablet to Mount Ebal itself. Did you know that many Israeli archaeologists who went to the university were trained with a certain paradigm that they have tried now to fit into what they discover in Israel. But guess what? They're finding out that the Bible is more accurate than what they have been taught in the university. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but come tonight. It's absolutely fascinating, and it should really encourage those of us who believe the Bible to help us realize that what they are digging up in Israel proves the Bible story to be true. So that's tonight at 6 o'clock. Remember the church library? Again, we've got some more books uh, added just recently, and uh, everything's been organized in there. If you have some time, go spend some time, take some books or videos with you. Operation Christmas Child, that is what our coin jar project is all about uh, for the summer for the shipping costs of Operation Christmas Child. Uh, again, remember Samaritan's Purse, the parent organization, ships these boxes uh, all over the world, and it costs them to do that. And so, for, again, they appreciate the fact that we provide boxes, but they also need help with the shipping. So that's, that's what this uh, offering is all about. And ladies, uh, instead of meeting upstairs and having just a regular fellowship time, the ladies are working quite hard, and if you look at the back table, there's some information back there about some of the items that they could use uh, to put into these boxes, and so I uh, talked to, uh, to to Debbie, talked to Trudy, talked to Patty, I uh, talked to Virginia, and uh, they'll give you information as to what could be used, and again, one of these days soon, they're going to actually start the assembly line going down there. Man, we meet upstairs at 11 uh, for a time of fellowship. And so, guys, we'd love to have you come and enjoy us for that. As we uh, prepare for our church picnic, it is now only one week away. So next Sunday evening, next Sunday evening, instead of meeting here at the church, we're going to be over at Wildwood Park. We would love to have everybody come and join us. The church is going to uh, provide a chicken, uh, also the uh, place settings, you know, the paper plates, napkins, stuff like that. So all you need to do is bring some sort of a hot uh, dish, a salad, and a dessert, something that you can share. Uh, we're going to have some games set up out there, if I understand it right, and just a nice uh, evening. Again, Wildwood Park. A lot of people say, where in the world is that? Well, if you go to Division Street, you know where Pioneer Park is, and you go north, cross Mill Creek, there's a park right there. And it's got a parking lot. It has bathrooms, a covered area, play equipment, the whole thing. You have to reserve it. We have it preserved, literally, for Sunday evening, the 24th. So come and join us. As we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, uh, there's a very interesting little article here. As you know, the President of the United States did a Middle East tour this last week, and his first stop was in Israel. And uh, one of the things he did was go to Ben Gurion International Airport. And apparently the United States is committed to helping provide security for that airport, especially air security. And there's a system called the Iron Beam. And it goes along with the Iron Dome. And if you don't know anything about it, please read this. And uh, be praying for the nation of Israel. Uh, as you know, uh, they are facing a very, very uh, difficult 
time as the nations around them, especially the nation of Iran, is dedicated to develop nuclear weapons and wipe them off the face of the earth. Well, I've read the end of the book. I know that's not going to happen. But uh, in the meantime, as Jews return from the four corners of the earth, they need our security and our prayers. As we uh, pray for alliance missions around the world, um, our prayer request in the bulletin takes you to Mexico. You might say, Mexico, why do we need missionaries, international workers in Mexico? Well, they need the gospel just like everything else. And so there is a church in Guadalajara, Mexico, entitled the Breath of Life Church. They have property, they want to build, and everything has come to a screeching halt because there's one inspector who won't permit them to do anything. Apparently, according to this prayer request, yeah, he is uh, looking for a, a little handout. And so they've actually gone to court over this, so please pray that God will work out this sticky situation. And uh, again, uh, the idea is to just be able to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you know, many of our international workers around the world have to do with uh, uh, local yokels, you might say. And a lot of them around the world, they, they don't get paid very much by their local governments. And so they're looking for a handout. And so please be praying for all of our international workers. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your love. And Father, we thank you for what you're doing, especially in the land of Israel. And Father, we thank you that at least at this point, uh, we as a nation are offering some assistance to Israel. Father, be with them, protect them during this time. Father, we, we read Bible prophecy. We know tough times are yet to come. But Father, in the end, we know that when Jesus returns, he's going to restore that nation. And so, Father, be with them and be with these who come from the four corners of the earth. And then, Father, we would pray for our international workers around the world, especially those in Mexico. And Father, we would pray for the situation in Guadalajara for this church. That they will get permission to build. They will build. And Father, we just pray that this church will be a true lighthouse to point people to Jesus. Be with them be with us. Of course, in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Before prayer and share, we're going to turn to 497 in your hymnal, Near to the Heart of God. There's three verses.
If you have your Bibles, you might want to open them to the book of Exodus this morning. We're going to be in the book of Exodus, and we're going to be talking about what it says. I can't believe it. We actually got that slide right. I do not know what happened this morning to the um, um, call to worship because I thought I had everything on there. I sip, but it wasn't there. So we'll see what happens. Grandmas. Grandmas. All right. Where are we? Well, it says we're going to be talking about the altar of incense. <clears throat> but just to bring back up to speed to let you know. Remember, uh, Joseph had a dream that his brothers and his mother and father would bow to him. They hated him for that, so they decided to kill him. But instead of killing him, they sold him into slavery. He makes some money off of him. And he ends up down in Egypt as a slave. Well, God has a plan. And the slave ends up being the prime minister of all Egypt. During seven years of plenty, but then seven years of drought. During the seven years of drought, his brothers end up going down to Egypt to beg for food, and they do bow before him. They end up staying in Egypt for a short period of time, only about 400 years. And during that period of time, they multiply into a nation. And Pharaoh decides, oh boy, these people are a problem. And he starts killing newborn baby boys. Well, Moses, protected by God, ends up being raised by Pharaoh's daughter as the prince of Egypt. At age 40, he decides he's going to deliver his own people. That doesn't work so well. So he runs off to the backside of the desert for 40 more years. Now at age 80, God visits him in a burning bush and says, go back and deliver my people. He says, no way. You got the wrong guy. Guess what? He ends up going back, and Moses and Aaron are used by God. God sends 10 plagues. Pharaoh finally says, go, get out of here. But then changes his mind at the Red Sea. Remember, God has to part the Red Sea to let Israel across. Now, Pharaoh and his army try to do the same thing, and God closes the sea and drowns them. They're out in the middle of the wilderness. They're now wandering in the wilderness. They end up at Mount Sinai. God has provided food for them, manna. He's provided water for them. But now he has given them the Ten Commandments. He's setting up a covenant with them because he wants them to be his people. He wants to be their God. And so now we're taking a look at a set of instructions about building a tabernacle, this place where God would come and meet with his people as they travel through the wilderness. So it's basically like a tent. Remember, we've taken a look at some of the furniture. In the most holy place, the place that only the high priest could go, there was the Ark of the Covenant. There was the mercy seat where God would dwell. We said that Jesus is our mercy seat. His shed blood covers our sins. Then going out into the outer area, which was the holy place, so far we've only seen two pieces of furniture. This morning we're going to see the third piece of furniture. We've seen the table of the showbread. Jesus is the bread of life. We've seen the lampstand. Jesus is the light of the world. When you leave the tent itself and go out into the courtyard, you've seen the altar of birth sacrifice. Jesus died once and for all. We've seen the courtyard and the whole purpose of the tabernacle as a place to meet God. We've seen the, the clothing they were supposed to make for the high priest and his sons, the sons of Aaron. We said that you and I are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We've talked about the consecrating of them and how we are to be sanctified. We've talked about this anointing oil. We are now to a new piece of furniture. It's called the altar of incense. Now, incense can be a good thing. It smells really good, I'm told. But one time, my daughter, one daughter and one son went with me to a funeral because we knew the family and we wanted to honor the kids. And at this funeral, the priest got out this incense burner. And every time he did something, he started swinging more incense. Well, this incense was really, really strong. And many of you know, I have sinus issues. By the time that 
service was over, I had the worst sinus headache I have ever had. I mean, it's like this incense burned my sinuses. So incense can be good, it can smell good in, in moderation. Well, we're going to talk about incense in the tabernacle, and then we're going to relate it to how that applies to our lives as New Testament believers. That's what we've tried to do as we've gone through this so far. Not just take a look at instructions as to how to build a tabernacle. Because I believe that everything that we've seen so far, in some way, points to what Jesus Christ has done for us and what he wants to do in believers' lives today. So incense was a fragrance. It smelled good. So basically, we're going to be talking about incense in the tabernacle and smelly Christians today. Right? <laughs> we're supposed to be a bunch of smelly Christians. You'll see what I have to say. All right, our key verse is not going to be in the book of Exodus, not in chapter 30, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, because I have to prove to you that I'm not really crazy, okay? That actually the New Testament does teach that we as believers can be a fragrant aroma in God's sight. So our key verse is going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, where it says this, for we are to God a sweet fragrance of Christ among those who are saved and among those who perish. We're going to come back to that text of scripture later and others. But the point is this. As incense was a sweet aroma in the tabernacle, so is the life of the believer today. We're going to talk about the fact that there is a way that we can actually do something just like the high priest burning incense and how it rose up to heaven. There's something we can do today as believers that does something similar. So you've got to stay awake to find out what that is. So the question that I need to ask myself is this. Am I a fragrant aroma in the sight of the Lord today? Is my life pleasing to him? <clears throat> is what I am doing now a tribute and an honor to him? So two things we're going to take a look at a sweet fragrance of incense, and a sweet fragrance of Christ. First of all, a sweet fragrance of incense. So again, remember, we talked about all the different things that Aaron and the priests had to do. Now, we're going to talk about a new piece of furniture, something that was not mentioned before, and it doesn't go out of the courtyard. Once it's built, Moses and Aaron are going to put it back the holy place, but in a very special spot, and for a very special purpose. So let's go to Exodus chapter 30, and take a look at verse 1. Also, you must make an altar for burning incense. You must make it of acacia wood. Now, again, remember, almost everything that was in the tabernacle was made of acacia wood, but then coated with either gold or silver or bronze. Acacia wood grew in the desert, and it was something that was basically impervious to insects. Verse 2, it must be a cubit in length, and its width a cubit. It will be square. Its height will be two cubits. The horn shall be of one piece with it. You must overlay it with pure gold, its top, its sides, all around, and its horns. And you must make a molding of gold all around it. So... The altar of incense was made of acacia wood overlaid with gold. It was 18 inches square and 3 feet high. Now, I haven't checked the price of gold recently. But even though it was not pure gold, just acacia wood overlaid with that much gold, you get an idea of the cost of such a thing. Verse 4. You must make two golden rings for it under its molding. You must make them on its two sides, on opposite sides of it, and they will be holders for the poles which will carry it. Then you must make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. So, again, everything had to be portable in the tabernacle. But they weren't supposed to just pick this thing up. They put these poles in it, lifted it up, and carried it. Can you imagine what the procession must have been like every time they moved? You remember the 
they had the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And when it moved, they were supposed to move. Can you imagine the, the, the people that had to take down this tent and then to carry everything? And the procession that it must have made as they went through the, the wilderness together. So one of the things they carried was this altar of incense. All right, so let's say they made it. Now, what did they do with it? Why did they even have it? Well, it says in verse 6, you must put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, in front of the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with you. So the altar of incense stood outside the veil in the holy place, not in the most holy place. Therefore, it was fairly close to the Ark of the Covenant, yet separated by the veil. The table of showbread represents communion with God. And the lampstand spoke of the testimony to the world. And now the golden altar speaks of the offering of adoration. So again, here's this picture. The average Israelite couldn't do this. But you're a priest. You and I are priests, right? So we can walk through the courtyard. We can walk past this, this big altar of burnt offering. And as you open the curtains and you step into this square, this, this holy place, on one side you'll see the table of showbread. On the other side, the light will be coming from the lamp. But right in front of you, where the curtain is that separates the holy place from the most holy place. And in the most holy place would be the Ark of the Covenant. Now sits this altar, small altar. And there, day and night, would be this incense that is burning and giving off this fragrant aroma that is rising up to heaven. So what is it all about? Well, remember he said that I will meet you there. Sprinkled throughout this description of the tabernacle and the furnish were reminders of the purpose of the tabernacle. It was a place for man to meet with God. So that's the whole purpose of this. This is a place of worship. And we're going to talk in a minute about how there needs to be, obviously, um, sacrifice that still takes place. But I want to remind you of something. This foreshadows of the future. On Friday, I, I did another memorial service uh, for a family that I have known for 45 years. By the way, I hope you realize how long you have had to be long-suffering and put up with Trudy and me. Because it was the summer, it, in July of 1977, that we became a candidate at this church. And the older people that were here there for some odd reason, asked us to come. So in September, we actually came. We started actually getting paid by the church in August of, of 1977. So it's been 45 years ago. 45 years ago, I met the Sherrod family. Uh, Millicent Sherrod Peterson, Mary and Kermit, was part of the Sherrod family. The communion table that we have right here, back when this was building belonged to the Evangelical United Brethren, Millicent and Don's parents, the Sherrods, were very active members. And when they died, they dedicated this communion table in their name. The stained glass window at the back in 1987, when Millicent Sherrod Peterson died, the family got together and donated that uh, stained glass window in her honor. So there's a lot of family history for the Sherrod family. Well, June Sherrod, which was Millicent's sister-in-law, would attend a church often. I knew her as well, and moved to Arizona, and at age 96, died uh, during COVID. And they couldn't do anything. Well, they finally had a, a memorial service yesterday, uh, Friday. Well, at that memorial service, afterwards we went out to the cemetery, and we're looking at all these di different shared plots. Shared here, shared there, shared everywhere. And I reminded them of a passage of scripture that eventually places like this cemetery won't be needed. You won't see gravestones like this anymore. And 
it ties in to exactly what we're talking about, the purpose of the tabernacle. Because in Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, what does it say about the future? And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Look, the tabernacle of God is with who? Men, you and I. And he will, what? Dwell with them. They shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. So, the tabernacle was a temporary structure. The temple, even, is temporary. Today, the Holy Spirit of God lives in our lives through the indwelling of the Spirit. But a time is coming in the future when we have the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. And God himself is going to dwell with us and live among us. He is going to tabernacle among us. And so this is what I was able to share with them there at that graveside. Again, if you go back and see all these different sharings, but eventually we won't need cemeteries. We won't need headstones because there will be no more death or dying or crying or pain because the old order of things will be passed away. A new order of things is yet to come. That's a hope that we have as, as believers. All right. Verse 7 says this. The joys of modern technology. There it is. All right. Aaron must burn sweet incense on it. Every morning when he trims the lamps, he must burn incense. When Aaron lights the lamps at sundown, he must burn incense on it. It is to be a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. So just as the lampstand was to keep burning all the time, just as every day outside they were to offer these sacrifices in the morning, in the evening. Every day Aaron was to enter the holy place, he was to refill the lampstand, and he was to offer this sacrifice of incense on the altar. So continually there would be this, this smell, this fragrance rising up to heaven, which again, we're going to see in a minute, represents something. All right, you must offer no strange incense on it, nor burnt sacrifice, nor grain offering. You must not pour out a drink offering on it. Priests were not permitted to offer God whatever they wanted on the altar of incense. Strange incense was prohibited. So there was something very, very specific that they were to put on this altar. Now, verse 10, Aaron must make atonement on his horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. Once a year, he must make atonement on it throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. Aaron shall make atonement on his horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. The altar of incense was not a place of sacrifice. Okay? The sacrificing happened outside in the courtyard. But it was a place for atoning blood. On the Day of Atonement, Aaron had to anoint the horns of altar incense with blood from the atoning sacrifice. Now, that wasn't the only place. On the Day of Atonement, he also opened the veil and he went into the most holy place. And he offered this blood sacrifice on the mercy seat. But again, the sacrifice had already taken place. The sacrifice had taken place outside. Now the blood was applied. Prayer is not the place sacrificial atonement is made. It is the place sacrificial atonement is enjoyed. We don't save ourselves through prayer. We pray because of Jesus' saving work on the cross. So I'm going to put a picture up on the screen that I found this week. It has to do with the difference between Christianity and religion. Okay? Religion says that I obey, therefore I am accepted. In other words, religion says if I'm good enough, and I do enough good things that somehow God is going to love me and accept me. Christianity says, I am accepted, therefore I obey. Aaron and the sons had to continually offer sacrifices day in and day out. This sacrifice of
said to burn continually over and over and over again. But today, we as believers, because we are saved, because the atonement has been made, now we can obey out of love. Not because we have to, but because of what has been accomplished for us. So, that's a sweet fragrance of incense. Now let's take a look at a sweet fragrance of Christ. Remember I said that this has an application to the lives of believers today. Okay? Everything we've seen so far about the tabernacle points to Christ and points to what God is doing to believers today. How does this altar of incense apply to us? Well, again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we find these words. Now, thanks be to God, who always causes us to triumph in Christ, and through us reveals the, what? Fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God a sweet, what? Fragrance of Christ among those who are saved and among those who perish. To the one, we are the fragrance of death which brings death. To the other, the fragrance of life, which brings life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many who are peddled the word of God. Instead, being sent by God, we sincerely speak in Christ in the sight of God. So, our lives as a whole are a fragrance. In God's sight, we are a sweet fragrance. Amongst believers, we are a sweet fragrance. But amongst unbelievers, <clears throat> they smell the fragrance of death. Because they know there's something different about us who are saved. All right? But we want to be pointing people to Christ. Now, we're going to see that incense is a picture of prayer. In the sweetness of its smell, in the way it ascends to heaven, Remember the golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints according to Revelation 5.8? The ministry of the altar of incense speaks of how God's people should continually come to him in prayer. So I want you to turn to the book of Revelation. So just like in the tabernacle, in the holy place, on this altar, this incense constantly was rising, the smell up to heaven. We as believers today, since we are the fragrance of Christ, are to pray. And our prayers are like this incense that is rising to God. How do we know that? Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. <clears throat> I saw a lamb in the midst of the throne, and in the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, standing as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sits on the throne. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one having a heart, and golden bowls of incense, which are, what? The prayers of saints. So in heaven, our prayers reach heaven and are like the sweet fragrance of incense that was burned in the tabernacle. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scrolls and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed to us, to God, by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made us kings and priests unto our God. We shall reign on the earth. So as we as believers get together, we are one with those in heaven. And as we pray, just like the incense rose up to heaven, to God as a sweet fragrance, we as believers, because we are the fragrance of God, when we come and we pray, our prayers ascend to heaven. Turn over in Revelation chapter 8 now. In Revelation chapter 8, Verses 3 through 4, it describes the golden altar of incense standing before God's throne. Here's what it says. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. 
he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hands. We've said that what we have in the tabernacle, later the temple, is a picture of what is going on in heaven. And again, how that all works, I don't know. Uh, John, he got an excellent view because he actually got to go there and see all this stuff. But apparently, there is an altar in heaven. And just as this incense is being offered, the prayers of the saints reach God, and we are a sweet fragrance. You know, sometimes we think when we pray, well, maybe we're, we're bothering God. You know, he's kind of busy today. You know, he's got that whole world to, to look out for. And besides, Eddie Jimenez is down there. Oh, my goodness, how much time God must spend trying to straighten out Eddie Jimenez. So I have these little issues, and, and should I really waste God's time by praying? Yes. The problem is, oftentimes, we only come and ask. How often do we come and praise? Do we actually thank God and worship Him as we pray? The prayers of the saints are like this incense. We're reminded of this in Psalm 141, verse 2. In Psalm 141, verse 2, it says this. Let my prayer be set before you as what? Incense. And the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So as we come before God in worship, we far exceed anything that was ever done in the tabernacle, anything that was ever done in the temple by Aaron and his sons, because now we are a royal priesthood. We are the redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So remember what we talked about, a sweet fragrance of incense, a sweet fragrance of Christ, our key verse this morning, again, is not in Exodus, but in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, before I read this, I want to remind you of something. You may think, well, that, that can't apply to me because I'm not perfect. Oh boy, if you only really knew me, you know, I, I, I'm really not everything that I should be. Well, I want to remind you before I read this verse. This verse is in 2 Corinthians, which means that Paul is writing to which church? The church in Corinth. Have you ever read 1 and 2 Corinthians? It's unbelievable to me that Paul calls them a church, that he calls them believers, that he calls them brothers and sisters in Christ. That they're saints. If there was ever a church that had problems, if there were ever people who had problems, it was the Corinthian believers. What does that mean? None of us as believers are perfect. Okay? So if Paul can write this to the Corinthians, he certainly can write it to you and me. So what does he say? Remember? 2 Corinthians 2.15 for we are to God a sweet fragrance of Christ among those who are saved and among those who perish. He wrote that to the Corinthians with all of their issues, with all of their problems, with all of their struggles. They were redeemed. They were believers. And because they were believers, they, along with Paul and all other believers, are a sweet fragrance of Christ. So what's our point? As the incense was a sweet aroma in the tabernacle, so is the life of the believer today. So the question is, am I a fragrant aroma in the sight of the Lord? Well, if Paul can write that to the Corinthians, he certainly can write it about us. So just as Aaron was supposed to go in day in and day out, morning and evening, to make sure that there was
was always this fragrance, always this burning of the incense. How often are you and I supposed to pray? Scripture says we are supposed to pray on Sunday morning at church between the hours of 11 and 12. Right? Now what is Scripture saying? We are to pray continuously. Now that doesn't mean that we have to get down on our knees, close our eyes, and fold our hands. You could be driving down the highway at 70 miles an hour, and I would encourage you, don't close your eyes to pray. But we can pray. We can be at work, and we can pray. We can be involved in a situation where we're dealing with somebody, and we need the Lord's help. And we can pray right then and there. We are to be praying continuously. And just as in the tabernacle, on this new piece of furniture now, okay, we already have the table of showbread, we already have the lampstand, now we have this altar that sets. By the way, where did they get this from? I've read that basically this came from what they made out of the courtyard. And they brought this in. And once a year, remember, Aaron had to put blood on it. We are out there with blood. We are saved. The atonement has already been made. Father God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your word. And Father, we thank you for these excellent instructions that you gave to Moses. Father, we thank you that although it's very interesting for us to rebuild the tabernacle, that there are applications for our lives today. Father, we thank you that we are a sweet aroma in your sight. Father, we thank you that our prayers end up in heaven as an incense before you. So, Father, help us as believers to live as believers, to be the Christians that we should be, filled with your spirit, depending upon you. Father, we pray that we truly will be a fragrance in your sight. What's in Jesus' name? We are all.